Hello and welcome to this Union Solidarity International web conference with Professor Steve Keen. Uh, we're very pleased to be speaking to Steve Keen again. We spoke to him about six months ago. Uh, Professor Keen is one of just a handful of people in the world who accurately correct, uh, predicted the financial crisis. So we see his viewpoints to be quite crucial. Uh, welcome back, Stephen. Thank you for speaking to us. We know it's very, very early where you are, uh, but we appreciate your uh, yep, dedication. I believe in to... anyone that's fine. <laughs> Really, listen, Steve, first of all, a happy new year and a happy new year to Jim and anybody else who watches this on YouTube or downloads it on iTunes. I think, first of all, Steve, I'd just like to kick off to talk about the T-shirt you're wearing. And I know that you'd also mentioned, they mentioned to me, my friend, that there was the, the Kickstarter campaign in relation to Minsky. So I think... At least it gives an explanation as to why you're wearing that T-shirt and the campaign. So maybe just start off with that, Steve. I think that would be helpful. Sure. Um, for the last year or so, I'm having a, a top-class mathematical programmer build a uh, simulation system for economics that is both monetary and dynamic, I call, which I've called Minsky. Um, really, as a way of trying to get economists uh, to move across to modern, modeling the economy as a monetary phenomenon. Because the great irony, uh, and Stephanie Kelton had a nice little tweet about this recently, the great irony is if neoclassical economists convince themselves they could model the economy as if there are no banks, no debt and no money. Mm -hmm. And that's why they didn't see the financial crisis coming fundamentally. They were wearing blindfolds uh, on just precisely the, uh, the phenomena that, that caused the crisis. So I have always had the attitude that they're essential to modeling the economy and I finally I managed to work out a way of making that simple to do by building what I call a godly table that enables me to type in financial flows in a double entry bookkeeping format and then generate a model of the financial monetary flows in the economy as well as the model of physical flows. And uh, this is all, I'm, I'm using technology that partly comes from engineering uh, where they've, got, they've been using uh, a, a, a laying out a, a visual way of laying out equations that, 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 that uh, dynamically simulate uh, an electronic system or a manufacturing system or something like that. And I've now combined that with this capacity of built by modeling the financial system. Now, I've done it so far with about a uh, thousand hours of programming time. And really to make this thing sing and dance, I need to give it at least 10,000 hours. And I'm putting out a Kickstarter campaign to up money to do that. Uh, and that's uh, uh, starting in about two weeks time. And the Good. idea is I donate, you know, put the money in, donate, uh, and uh, with that, you can uh, both know that you're helping build a, a monetary approach to capitalism, to modern capitalism, which hopefully will enable us to prevent crises like this in the future, because economists will be looking at bank debt and money. And uh, also, and if you pay enough money, you get a T-shirt, you get uh, a, a, a tablet version of the software, etc., etc. Little, little goodies there as well. So, and all you need to do to, to help out is to, to log onto the uh, onto the Kickstarter campaign page, which I'll advertise widely when it, when it launches. And then when you say you want to donate a certain amount of money, be it $2 or 25 or 100 or whatever else, uh, and then take you through to Amazon. And you've bought a book on Amazon, you're ready to donate that money, you click and put it in. If I don't raise the minimum that I've set, which is $50,000, nothing comes out of your pocket. But if I, if, if, you do, if I do raise the minimum, then at a later stage, that is transferred from your credit card or whatever and you help find Minsky. Sounds fantastic. Brilliant and very fascinating and interesting to hear. I remember, Steve, when we spoke to you in a previous web conference in August that you were in the construction process of the modelling and you were actually encouraging people to go onto yeah. the website and try out the modelling as and it was a, a work in progress. And I just want to pick up on the point that you made, which directly relates to the, the modelling that you've got in place. Because when we yeah. met towards the end of last year in London and I had a nice glass of wine or two, we, 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 had, we had the conversation uh -huh. about how neoclassical economics does not capture the reality of the economy, yet gives us analysis of what should be happen, happening and then lo and behold, a surprise that it doesn't come to reality, but yet it remains the dominant economic 
theory in the world. I just want to pick out your thoughts a little bit more, rather than some of the technicalities, Steve, that why, despite neoliberal and neoclassical economics being proven to be wrong, the current situation quite lucidly shows how it's wrong, why is it still the most predominant economic philosophy in the world? Because I, I think getting to the heart of that is a very, very important point. I think there are two parts to it. One is that uh, any intellectual belief like, like uh, neoclassical economics um, is held in such a way that it's, it's got components of religion to it as well as components of dispassionate science. And if you have somebody who believes something and then it pro is proven to be false, a bit like the people waiting for the Mayan philosopher for predictions to come through at the end of 2012 there, I think I'll turn up to the next one. <laughs> the, the, the abandoning the belief that the ancients actually know anything is extremely hard for people who believe the ancients are getting we didn't know. And equally for economics, it's very, very hard to break away from that way of thinking. And that's part of it. And you'll, you can see the same thing applying at the, at the end of the 19th century when Max Planck, I think in 1896, derived the equations that solved the black body radiation problem but required uh, the, uh, the assumption, which we now know to be a fact, that energy is discrete, it comes in small units called quanta or quantum, and the Planck constant is now part of how we think about the universe and so on. And he said and he, he attempted to convince his colleagues who believed that energy was with a smoothly varying thing, the Maxwell approach, and he finally gave up and just said, he wrote those wonderful lines about uh, history advancing one funeral at a time, or science advancing one funeral at a time. So even in physics that applies. But the important thing that Max Planck had that we don't yet have, though I'm, I believe Minsky can do it, we need an alternative paradigm as well. You can't ask people to abandon something if that means they've got to believe nothing. Absolutely. So what I'm doing with Minsky is saying you can have a monetary, dynamic, non-equilibrium uh, approach to economic modelling. You can do it, and here's the tool. So I think it's uh, we have to have both, and that's why I'm now focusing on it's not on trashing neoclassical economics, which from my point of view is like shooting you know, fish in a barrel in many ways. Uh, it's, it's now a case of saying, let's build an alternative, here it is, let's start getting students and progressive teachers of economics using Minsky and showing you can simulate a dynamic economy quite easily. Mm. I think, could you just flesh out a little bit further, Steve, what is the alternative paradigm that you are working on at the moment, along with other people, I mean it's all part of a, these things all thread together oh, yeah. and make a quilt, don't they? And, there's other fantastic economists around the world making contributions that hopefully build this alternative paradigm. Can you just flesh out a little bit further some of the key, some of the key components to that alternative paradigm? Yeah, well, I'm far from the only person doing it. And uh, when you're doing when you're doing an early thing like we're doing now, of course, it's going to be areas where people just disagree with each other. Where later over time. One person will realise they've got to concede one thing, another person has got to concede something else, and you finally get a coherent vision. So one obvious, uh, the people who are very much aligned with the way that I'm thinking, for example, my, my closest research colleagues, Michael Hudson, uh, Dirk Bezema, uh, Matthias Grisselli, who's uh, a de director of the deputy director of the Fields Institute, the world one of the world leading applied mathematics units. We're all working very much together to build an alternative paradigm, um, which uh, the fundamentals of which are that it must be monetary. It must include banks as an essential part of the uh, model of the economy, and it must be dynamic. Now, uh, at the same time, you have the modern monetary theory group coming lively out of Kansas City, Stephanie Kelton, uh, Randy Ray, uh, Warren Mosler, St Scott Forwiller, um, Matt. Uh, there's a whole lot of people there who are building an approach, and their orientation is coming at the elephant at a different angle to us, if you like. If you got, I think the, uh, the image of the the elephant and lion men of Hindustan make a lot of sense here. We're coming at the elephant of the overall monetary capitalist production economy from different angles. Now, I'm taking it from the angle of the private monetary system. They're taking it from the angle of the government monetary uh, component. We're trying to bring those two together as well. A bit, a bit of you know, um, discord at various times, but I think we're getting a, a combined vision. So that's another group that are doing work like that. And uh, in general, the people that I've been working with most in the last 20 years are people who have been working in dynamic modelling. So Paul Almeron, who's essential looking at from the multi-agent point of view, 
uh, based in London, of course, and one of the world's leading uh, practitioners of multi multi agent modelling. Uh, Thomas Lux, who's a, a established the Economic Z Journal. Um, uh, there's a, the whole range of people. We've all been on the periphery. We're all now trying to come in and occupy the homeland of economics and push the neoclassical vision out of the way. But the essential things about that vision, it must be monetary, it must be non-equilibrium, and it must be dynamic. Thanks for that response, Steve. And, and it's fascinating and it's, it's really heartening for people to hear who, like ourselves and people who perhaps are watching this clip in your website or perhaps on our website, that there, that there is a concerted an attempt to build that alternative paradigm because it's it's difficult sometimes to actually have a great degree in faith and hope that that alternative paradigm is going to be built. So organisations like ourselves, like you, Steve, like Jim, who's from New Zealand Economics, that we are working together in order to try and foster that different paradigm. I, I'm really interested, Steve, in why, and I think it's really fascinating because I think sometimes we take it as a given why neoclassical economics is wrong. And you've just said that the key component there being how banks and financial institutions seem to be largely irrelevant from a neoclassical framework. And we look in today's economy as the private money element, which you discussed there, Steve, and the elements of private debt have a huge personal private debt as well as national private debt have national debt have a huge yeah. impact on the, the economy i think just hearing a little bit more steve about why e neoclassical economics is so wrong because i think we need to bang the drum a lot more about this and a lot louder about this yeah. in order to penetrate the consciousness of why yeah. that philosophy is morally and economically and philosophically bankrupt <laughs> well, it starts with, let's start with intellectual, which is the point that I always start from. But what, what they, and there's actually Stephanie Kelton had a wonderful tweet just recently where she was talking about, actually we have a blog post at first, where she mentioned that she started trying to discuss money and again a master's class, she was in maybe an undergraduate class, and the neoclassical lecturer's response was, if you're one of those people who think money matters, you're probably also one of those people who enjoys beating yourself out of the back with a rubber hose. <laughs> 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 In other words, they have, become, they have become so convinced of their little uh, uh, demonstration that money doesn't matter that yep. they literally believe they can be bank step money out of it. And you would all hopefully remember the uh, exchange I had with Krugman, uh, who at least now thinks debt has to be taken seriously under some circumstances, like whenever he hits what we call the zero lower bound, when interest rates are down to zero, he reckons the level of debt then, private debt then does matter. Yep. But he wrote that comment to me saying, I'm also including banks, the banking sector, in the stories where it's well, quote unquote, but why is it so relevant to a story about debt and leverage? Yeah. You know, unbelievable. But that's what they convince themselves of. Now, the way they do it is by a first year exercise where they, let's imagine you have an amount of income and we double your income and double all prices. What happens to the amount of uh, what do you buy? And the answer is nothing. And that's called the, the money illusion argument. It's just fall to that. I know I did at one point. And, uh, and therefore think, oh, money doesn't really matter. It's, it's only relative prices that matter, not absolute prices. So we work in the price of apples in terms of the price of, of pigs, rather than working in the dollar price of pigs and the dollar price of apples. Now, that argument is only true if there's no credit. Because if you have no credit and no income, you can buy no goods. But if you live in a world with credit, um, then you can buy goods uh, with, by accessing your credit even without income. And that means that if only if you not only double all prices and double all incomes, but play a very clever manipulation of the level of debt and the rate of interest, can you actually mean that doubling all prices and doubling incomes has no impact at all? You think about being with a mortgage. If, if, the, if you had a sudden doubling of all prices and incomes, you'd be better off because your mortgage would cost you less to service. Now, it's, and also, you can't just simply, oh, let's double the rate of interest then, because since you're paying off the debt over a period of time, there's a strongly non-linear component to the impact of, uh, of changing the rate of interest or changing the amount of debt you owe. It's not something you can simply do. But that, that myth construct which says, let's assume there are no banks debt and money, and we double all prices, incomes, and, and see what happens, and nothing happens, therefore, banks debt and don't money, 
matter. Uh-uh, not true, because you start off by assuming they don't exist to get your conclusion. Exactly. Unless you start, they, they do exist, and then see an inclusion, you can't. So this 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 mental flip that they they play with children when they're you know, 18 year old kids in in their first year in university that's what persists them to leave it out and that's intellectually bankrupt. You start from that point of view and then everything you build is an equilibrium model, uh, which ultimately in this way ideology comes in. The outcome of that argument is to say you know, we live we live in the best of all possible worlds and the way to make it better than it, it is already is to make it more free market. <coughs> That's that's the uh, the orientation they have, and they don't even realise that it's got an ideological component to it because this perfect model they have works uh, when you remove every last government intervention, every last uh, union intervention, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and let the market decide everything. Then it's perfect, and that becomes an ideological drive to eliminate what those non-market interventions, and we end up with the sort of catastrophe we're in now. Yep. Thanks very much, Steve. Thanks for that excellent response. And Jim, feel free to type in any questions on the side. I mean, we're delighted to hear some of your comments. If you feel you want to type something in, we can, of course, get that across to Steve. Steve, when we last spoke to you in August, uh, we had a conversation about the state of the world economy in general, of course, but particularly the Eurozone. And at that time... You had been travelling around and have been doing so recently, speaking to people within central banks, global financial institutions to give them some of your insight and expertise. Now, I went and watched that web conference again just last week and just to get the points that you made and to see if we were one millimetre closer to our solution than we were in the 1st of August. And I don't see how the world institutions, whether they be government or financial institutions, have taken us one millimetre forward in trying to resolve this crisis. Now, when we spoke in London towards the end of last year, you seem to seem to have just a little bit more hope than me that some people within financial institutions around the world, we don't need to mention any names, were realising that they are solutions weren't working and that they were frantically trying to come up with different possible policy solutions that could help the world economy. Do you want to talk a little bit more about that, Steve? Because I'm I'm failing yeah, to see yeah. how we're one millimetre forward, my good friend. <laughs> it, it's it's more a case that people are beginning to despair of the direction they're going in. So um, I, I, I met people in the European Union and uh, people in the American Congress and so on. And I have to say the Europeans are closer to this than the Americans are because, of course, the American economy hasn't gone anywhere down, near, down as deeply as the European has. Um, but there's realisation in the central banks and in some of the treasuries that w the conventional policies they're following, the austerity policies, are not only not working but are clearly making things worse. The trouble is you've got this simple momentum from the politicians um, that, uh, that, you know, we've got to treat the, the, uh, the economy like a household. Uh, it's spending more than it earns, cut back on the spending, and that'll get better. That, that, that is so clearly wrong, and it, 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 it took the evidence of, you know, 25% unemployment in Spain and Greece, and even now falling output in Germany, uh, for it to becoming apparent that it's failing. So what I'm finding is that I'm... The doors for, for me in treasuries and central banks are opening. They yeah. were shut well and truly for the last seven years. Uh, just recently, I've had numerous invitations from central banks and from, from treasury institutions to come and talk to them. And like, for example, I, I had a meeting uh, in Europe and discussed the fact that as part of the uh, campaign to get out of the crisis, they'd gone from having a rule that uh, the states could have a 3% of GDP deficit to saying they could have a half a percent deficit, <coughs> which of course makes the squeeze even worse. And that's what we've seen is that actually added the pressure to Spain, Italy, Portugal and so on. And um, really, the people are quite willing to say inside, we know it hasn't worked. It's gone, it's, it's gone, it's made things worse, we're aware of that. But it's so hard to go in the opposite direction. 
Mm. So there is that that realization there, which uh, is good to see. Uh, but like you say, it's 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 not a millimeter closer in terms of public policy. No doubt about that. But it is closer in terms of um, in in terms of what the, the bureaucrats are willing to use as an intellectual framework. The trouble is they still have to persuade the politicians, and politicians. Uh, they're, they're, you don't get to be a politician because you're a genius. You have to be a politician because you're good at selling yourself to other people. And narcissism is more likely to be uh, uh, to be the you know, the requirement you fulfil than intelligence. So you have to have a simple way of showing them how the economy functions, which is different to the household model they have. And again, that's why I've tried to build a software package like Minsky, which is visual. You can show in a politician say, okay, try the policy response you want, see what happens. Oh dear. That wasn't what you expected, was it? <laughs> Hopefully, you know, get through it that way. Yeah. I mean, you're absolutely right in terms of public policy. We aren't one step forward. There's a couple more points that I would like to pick up on, Steve. But I see Jim's asked a question. He's typed it in the box. I don't know if we can just read it out. Uh, yeah. That's right. <clears throat> Uh, we have a problem over here with what to do with the apparent shortage of housing. A question can be, what do you do to create real housing in a way that doesn't tweak the bubble? For me, this seems to summarize the problem with how the money economy works in relation to the real economy. In Australia, you argue against the FTHB tax concession. This appears to help people to buy a real house, but in fact, its effect on the money economy is to inflate the bubble. Yeah. Um, that's what the, the first home buyers, they call it first home buyers grant right, um, okay. over here. And in fact, what it does is it gives it, a, it adds an extra $7,000 to the deposit that first home buyers have when they go shopping. And the banks say, oh, $7,000 more, not 7% leverage factor. <laughs> Let's make it $150,000 more. You can bid for the house. What we do, you can go and bid on an existing property, help drive the price up $50,000. And, uh, and then what actually happens is you, you get seven grand from the government, but you've got to take out an extra $60,000 in debt to buy the place. And, uh, and you end up uh, you know, saddled with a huge mortgage and the vendor walks away smiling with a huge profit and people reckon houses are a great investment. So you can't do it by giving a grant to the first home buyer. I would actually rather, rather say that if you have a, a first home buyer, buyer's grant, then what happens is that the money is given to the builder directly, not to the buyer. You're going to get a first time buyer's grant. They said, here's a check you can give to the person you're buying the house off. You can't give it to the bank. And that means rather than being $7,000, you know, times a, a leverage factor of 30, it makes it $200,000 that you're then shopping with. You get $7,000, you can give $7,000 to, to the person you're buying it from. You have to stop it being thing that feeds into the leverage cycle in, in, a, in, in the banking sector. So that's, that's part of it. But it's not actually, the, the, it's an apparent shortage of housing. And part of this comes down to creating a sense of panic. And that's what the, the, the property lobby will do. And the real estate agents are always going to say, you've got to buy now or it'll all be gone. You know? And that urgency is a huge part of why they help drive prices up. You need state provision of housing. Uh, to, for take off the people at the bottom level of the system, you need um, viable private construction as you have with people like Pavel Pitch, uh, the major major pusher for that over in New Zealand, um, and you need to get the government largely out of trying to manipulate the asset markets. And really, the reason that the Australian government used the first time owners grant, the first time buyers grant, was not to help out the buyer; it was to give an artificial like uh, adrenaline hit to the economy when it was in a slump. And the Treasury told uh, Howard when he got to power as well, that if you want to give the economy a quick, sharp job, double the first home buyer's grant. Now, it wasn't to help out the buyer, it was done to give the economy an artificial boost. And it works just like giving steroids to an apple. They go a lot faster and they have been at 35. Brilliant. That's a, that's a great response, Steve. I think it neatly t takes us on to some of the possible policy solutions and of course different countries ha have their own different uh, measures that can help their own specific situations but I'd, I'd just like because we are very European centric shall we say perhaps because this is 
one of the epicenters, if not the epicenter of the, the global financial crisis at the moment, uh, along with America, that we are no further forward in terms of policy solutions. Within Germany, as you just mentioned, Steve, we see the, the economy contract by 0.5% in the last quarter, Britain by 0.3%. Mm. What is the policy solution? Let's extend austerity for three extra years to bring down the debt. That is the policy solution that has been developed by the UK government. And the measures that the, the Eurozone have adopted, principally through German largesse, is not dissimilar. So this just seems to us, yeah. particularly in Europe, to be a slow car crash. But this is going to be a car crash nonetheless. Because while some policymakers might have admitted that they're on the wrong road and they despair at that, they're still going to continue down the road, Steve. So how do you think this is going to play out, particularly in Europe, in the sort of time frames associated with this? Because we are seeing no remedies at all. Things that are being suggested, such as extending the debt repayment by two years, it's different shades of black. It's still the, the colour is still black. So how do you think this is going to play oh, yeah. out, Steve? Because there is no remedies that are being enacted, and the sort of alternative paradigm that we want to get on the agenda, whether we have got the muscle to do it in the short time frame in order to make people wake up to the the path that they're on, you know, it's going to be very difficult, as you know far better than me. So your 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 feelings and your gut instincts in this, Steve, I think would be very interesting for people to hear. Um, my my gut my, my gun instinct, unfortunately, is that it's going to be the same as the nineteen thirties, and we'll uh, we'll start waking up to it when the fascists take over somewhere in Europe. And my my bet is the first place it's going to happen is probably Greece, given the size of gold and on there right now. They'll come in and they'll reject all the policies. They'll just, uh, refuse to pay the debt. And simply because they do that, the economy will start to recover. And that's the real danger to me, that uh, the fascists will get the credit for it. And it'll be seen as the fact that Chuck, the, the, uh, you know, the people will think the reason the economy has improved is they chuck the foreigners out. And you get the xenophobic uh, 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 you know, backlash that we had back in the 1930s. Not as bad, out, hopefully, but still that same sort of xenophobic thing. Uh, and in that political situation, then politicians in liberal countries have realised, hey, we don't want that to happen here. There will be a political pressure to change from austerity towards uh, you know, providing social welfare so on. The trouble is it'll be, it'll be a, a, you know, an incredibly negative thing for, for Europe and probably put it back in some ways to the pre-Second World War um, social interactions, which I think is deadly. Uh, but in terms of getting out of the crisis overall, um, we only got out of the great. We had, I took a good look at the numbers for the U.S. Congress when I gave a talk there uh, in December. And when you look at the numbers, the the factor that really got us out of the Great Depression was government spending for the Second World War. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm, pessimistically, I think that we're going to find a similar sort of thing. We'll only get out of this when government spending to fight, uh, well, to try to reverse the impact of irreversible climate change. Uh, that is likely to be our Hitler. And uh, it'll be a case when, when that finally strikes us, and that could strike us in five or ten years' time in something absolutely blatantly obvious like Greenland missing or the West Cape, the Antarctic sliding off or a catastrophic uh, breakdown of the of the tundra. Then when that happens, then we might finally get uh, past the climate sceptics, and then it'll be a case of who gives a, a damn about the debt that people are right now. We've got to, we've got to you know, in... We've got to spend to build technology that's going to prevent the, the climate catastrophically getting worse. And then in that situation, we'll forget about this problem, solve the other problem or attempt to solve the other problem. And by doing so, solve this one as well. Now, the intelligent thing to do would be to do what Michael Hudson has said for so long and so well. And that is realise the debts that can't be repaid won't be repaid. Absolutely. And work out how you're not going to repay them. Absolutely, Steve. Uh, that's a... A really interesting response and we've had a conversation with Michael before similar to yourself where he's given a very fine articulation of the need for governments to realize how debt forgiveness is absolutely essential and and 
if we are to avoid some of the, the pitfalls of the, the, 19, the 1930s. Steve, is there simple things, you know, in three or four bullet points, shall we say, like an economic programme that you would recommend that governments and financial institutions should be taking forward that could put not only continental economies but the world economy on on a path towards economic growth and reducing unemployment which is horrific particularly across Europe as a simple policy yeah. ideas that you would recommend that needs disseminating and wider distribution through USI's contact list, through your own contact list, and other people who are perhaps listening to this, yeah. such as Michael's debt forgiveness idea. Yeah, we, we have to, the first thing you have to realize what's causing the problem, that's excessive private debt. Yeah. It was used to finance Ponzi schemes, uh, not genuine instruments. So you've got to eliminate that debt, but you have to do it in such a way that it doesn't penalize people who regard themselves as savers. So that's that's the yeah, that's double issue. So my uh, original proposal was what I call a modern debt jubilee, where you create government money through the Federal Reserve System or Central Bank System, and that uh, then results in a, a per capita uh, payment uh, for the um, for everybody. But if you work out proportional to wealth or proportional to the number of people, it's 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 just a question of a large injection of money, government created money to the economy. And the way that would go in is if you were in debt, you would have to pay that down, no choice. So if you have any debt, the money is used to cancel your debt. But if you have no debt, then you get the money. You get a cash injection. Now that would then mean that the banking sector would then get a, if the debt was paid down, then of course the assets, the, the income earning assets of the banking sector would contract. And if the banking sector had sold those assets to people who sold them to those as savers, they would also fall in value. But the savers would be compensated by the cash injection in the first place, and the banking sector would shrink, and that's what we need to have happen. The banking sector, particularly in America, is about three or four times as large as it should be. It's a cost. It's not a profit center. We've let it grow that large because it funded a Ponzi scheme. We have to shrink it by a factor of about three. In England, it could be even bigger than that, given how ridiculous don't your uh, your shadow banking system is. Your your, your private debt level uh, is about 450 percent of GDP. And 250% of that is, is, is the shadow banking sector's debt to the, to the real banking sector. Mm. It's worse than America. So that has to shrink. Yeah. Um, so the policy would do that. A modern debt jubilee would do that. Now, there are other ways to go about it as well. I had an American uh, conservative commentator take up my idea and say, what about buying the mortgages off people? So that when you bought the mortgage, uh, the government would own, uh, would own the property effectively. And then they could they could charge you know a, a very low rate over a 30 year period with the prices adjust that way something of that nature. But again, the issue you have to be careful about is that people will block this on the whole moral hazard argument yeah. unless you make sure that savers, people who are not in debt, benefit as much as debtors do. So I'd modify that proposal in some way to have the ownership pass across to savers so they get an income stream out of out of the debt. Uh, but something as a discriminatory way of produce outstanding level of private debt, well, at least 50% across most of the world, or larger than that would be necessary in England. Uh, America, probably 70%, 80% 70 reduction. Do that in a way that doesn't discriminate between people who are not in the banking sector. Then we would remove the financial constraint that is actually the real reason the economy is not growing. That would be the fundamental thing. After that, uh, get governments the banking sector out of asset market speculation because one of the great problems is that it isn't just the, the uh, banking sector that's made money out of um, out of manipulating asset markets governments have also played curry with the public by what they've done on that front and the australian government is classic in that sense where it's used the first time owner scheme and negative gearing and halving the rate of capital gains tax as ways of spiking the property market and through the extra money people borrow from the property market, causing a false sperm in the economy that they then take credit for. So it isn't just uh, the finance sector we've got to get out of um, out of uh, asset markets; it's getting the government out of there as well. Thank you, Steve. Um, that 
whole conversation um, is very, very interesting and it's both encouraging and depressing. It's encouraging because clearly there are solutions and there are policy instruments that can be used to make a real difference. The depressing thing is that um, there's just no political will to make that. And I guess what we can hope for is that someone will break rank somewhere. There will be, you know, some, some country will institute a, a different policy, will take some of these ideas on board. Then there'll be clear evidence um, to, to counter the austerity argument that, that there is a different way of doing things. And then hopefully that makes the, the spreading of the idea that much easier because um, the, the problem we face now is this, the, 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 the received wisdom that austerity is necessary versus the the voices of dissidents which are are just not given the um the the platform that they need um i think that that's all that we have and i also know that it's 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 a it's very early okay. um i don't know if you'd like to um i see jim's just posted something let's just see what what jim says before we finish um yeah. Uh, if the house passed into public ownership permanently as part of a deal, we'd benefit from moral hazard, if you like, even though an owner gained as well. I guess I'm interested in doing things in the real economy that can be shared by everyone, e.g. housing that's kept in the commons. Uh, that's a very good point, I think, is uh, uh, the reference to the commons as well. Um, yeah, th thanks for your, your comments, Jim, uh, and your participation today. And in the, our previous web conference, I, I think... You know, events like this, and I know that, Steve, you have regular web public web conferences yourself uh, and talk to people in business and in academia. Having these conversations, I think, is absolutely essential in order to try and develop and propagate a different and alternative paradigm. We're all small, uh, little bits in the chain, and hopefully that, you know, linking together you know, we can have a degree of strength that we otherwise wouldn't have. And I think that's really, really important. I think that's why when we host events like With Your Good Self, Steve, we'll be having one with James Galbraith in the very near future as well. It's absolutely essential mm -hmm. that within our respective communities and our areas of interest, ours being in the labour movement in particular, that we are able to try and disseminate ideas and give them oxygen and to open up doors that perhaps we hitherto haven't been very good at opening. And I think that's a very essential part of what USI is trying to do, what you're trying to do, Steve, and I know, Jim, your involvement in economics in New Zealand as well. So, Steve, breakfast is on me the next time, since I promised you dinner the last time, and since you've had to get up at 6 a.m. and participate in this web conference, I just want to thank you once again. I know you've got a very hectic schedule and other things that are on your plate at the moment. And I'm sure anybody who's interested could go to Steve's website to find out a little bit more about his role in academia. Yeah, I think we should just mention that as well. And to really thank you for your time and your participation in these web conferences, Steve, because hopefully some of the ideas that you're propagating will get an oxygen within the labour movement that perhaps they wouldn't get and we can pick up the baton in some of these ideas. I know that in some of our previous web conferences, people within the labour movement within the UK and Ireland have been very interested in some of the discussions that we've been having with academ academics and are going to take them forward to their union policy conferences, which is very, very heartening to hear that its ideas are getting elevated and distributed. So, Steve, Thanks a lot, mate. We really appreciate your time and getting up for us so early. And apologies at my end because I just do not know what Australian time is. And I humbly apologise for getting you out of your bed probably at half past five in the morning. So thanks very much. And uh, before that, before I go, one little last plug. If you get some of those union groups and, and unionists to support the Minsky program, I'll be launching in a couple of weeks' time. Keep an eye out for it on Kickstarter. Uh, we can be a lot stronger if we do it together. And if I got 10,000 people chucking in 25 bucks each, I'm one quarter of the way to the money I need to really make this into an absolute top shot program. And I can hope to get us away from neoclassical dogma. So 
That'd be a great way to help. Yep. And you've made your plug, Steve, and I'm sure people who are watching it and listening to it will, I'm sure, take it on board. Thanks a lot, mate. Love the t-shirt. We're loving the t-shirt. Okay, good luck. Thanks a lot, everybody, for listening and watching this web conference with the very esteemed Professor Steve Keane. Thanks a lot, everybody. Bye.